All right, we are back with our discussion of social disorganization. Now, this early ideas and, and kind of data from Sean McKay pointing out how crime is associated with these certain neighborhoods, this zone in transition, um, poverty, disease, dilapidation of buildings, all those things <clears throat> were really kind of important for 20th century criminal justice, right? Um, Samson came along a few decades later and they kind of expanded on this idea, right? Started talking a little bit about more about how this whole process of social disorganization, disorganization works to create areas in which crime happens, right? And Samson kind of coined the term collective efficacy, all right? And what Samson meant by collective efficacy was the ability of a geographic area to either exercise informal social controls or to initiate the process of formal social controls. So in other words, if something happens in a neighborhood, what are the odds that the, the residents of the area will engage those informal social controls, um, you know, trying to prevent this criminal or deviant act uh, using non-legal means? Or <clears throat> what is their kind of ability or desire to uh, enact the formal social controls, i.e. call the police, right? So high collective efficacy means neighborhoods or areas have uh, more of those informal social controls, a uh, higher likelihood of engaging the former social controls, but low levels of collective efficacy are where those things just don't happen or can't happen or just happen less often, right? And it's those structural factors that Sean McKay identified in zone two, the poverty, dilapidation, heterogeneity, uh, mobility of residents, all those things are the, the pieces that diminish this collective efficacy of a neighborhood, right? So in other words, if we wanna increase collective efficacy, we have to reduce those uh, those structural factors that are issues, the poverty, the mobility of residents, the, you know, all those other issues. All right. So one of the ways that researchers have tried to measure this, right. Um, is by looking at a thing they call concentrated disadvantage. And concentrated disadvantage is supposed to be a measure of this kind of collective efficacy, structural factors causing crime or reducing collective efficacy, all those things. But it's been defined specifically in research a lot of different ways. And depending on exactly how you define it, can have a relatively large impact on how well it's connected to issues like crime. Because if you define this concentrated disadvantage one way, you might find it's really highly correlated with crime. But if you define it this other way, you find it's not correlated with crime at all, right? And a lot of those definitions come down to just kind of weird value judgments that are not necessarily appropriate. Like, one measure of concentrated disadvantage is things like a percentage of residents of the neighborhood who are black or minority members, minority racial or ethnic groups. Other um, measures of concentrated disadvantage are things like percentage of households with single mothers, right? And those are kind of uh, difficult uh, ethically. Some measures of concentrated disadvantage use crime itself as a, a, a part of this measure of concentrated disadvantage. Does the area have a lot of crime? Yes. Then it has high rates of concentrated disadvantage. 
So, of course, we're going to then find that high rates of concentrated disadvantage have high rates of crime. That's a tautology. It's circular. We're using crime to measure concentrated disadvantage and then finding that it's correlated with crime. Duh. Right? That's self-fulfilling. No matter how much concentrated disadvantage we have, even in kind of the worst neighborhoods, it's still a really, really small minority of juveniles who are involved in delinquency and a really small minority of adults that are committing crimes. So is this, if this concentrated disadvantage and if this kind of these measures of uh, social disorganization are the cause of crime, why are even the worst neighborhoods so have such small minority, small number, small percentage of its people committing these crimes? Shouldn't it be like most people or even everybody in, in like the worst neighborhoods? Shouldn't it, shouldn't everybody be a criminal? Right. There's also kind of one of the, contentions is that these areas, you know, the zone two socially disorganized, um, high concentrated disadvantage areas aren't necessarily the ones where more crime is happening. It's just the one that gets more attention from police and other formal control agencies. And thus it has more recorded crime, but not more or not as much more uh, uh, actual crime than other areas. It's just that it gets enforced more, it gets discovered more, and thus it gets recorded more in these socially disorganized area than it does in the less socially disorganized areas. And another big problem with, with kind of all this social disorganization research is what's the proper unit of analysis? Do we judge social disorganization and concentrated disadvantage and collective efficacy in the uh, census block, the neighborhood, each street, zip codes, right? So how small or how large an area is the proper unit of analysis for, for this group this community that can be either organized or disorganized, that can have high levels of concentrated disadvantage or collective efficacy or low levels of concentrated disadvantage or collective efficacy. So it's not really clear what the proper kind of geographic area is for, for measurement and tracking of crime and collective efficacy and all those things, right? Now, there have been a few different kind of programs or policies or um, kind of methods by which the powers that be have attempted to reduce levels of social disorganization, increase levels of collective efficacy, uh, or at least help kind of the problems of these uh, economically disadvantaged areas. And... Um, and thus kind of reduce crime and poverty and all those other issues, right? Now, the, we're only going to talk about a couple of them. The first one we're going to talk about is the Chicago Area Project, right? This is, came directly after Sean McKay's uh, kind of, um, you know, that whole social disorganization, Zone 2. Um, after all that research came out, starting in about in the late 1930s, Chicago decided to kind of, have a concentrated effort to increase the amount of social organization in these zone two areas. And the intention there was to reduce poverty, reduce crime, reduce all those other social ills, mental illness, drug and alcohol abuse, by reducing the amount of social disorganization in these problem areas of the city that Sean McKay had identified, right? So they wanted to increase 
community engagement with things like, you know, sports teams and community centers and, um, you know, any anything that they could do to kind of get community members out and interacting with each other and getting to know one another and, and, and bonding with each other. And then simultaneously reduce the, the negatives, reduce the physical dilapidation of buildings, you know, reduce the, the graffiti and the pollution and the, you know, all those other kind of negative factors that drove up social disorganization, right? And one of the good things here is we have lots of long-term data because this, you know, this started almost 100 years ago. So we have, you know, we have lots of data about how this has impacted the, you know, and this is an ongoing project or, or at least the effects of this project are, are still ongoing. And what they found was generally good results. It seems that these efforts probably had some kind of benefit. But one of the issues was the implementation was really uneven right? Um, they didn't have a whole bunch of money for this program. So they had to get like volunteers to do these different processes and like, you know, creating these community bonds. Um, and some of those volunteers did a really good job. And some of those volunteers really didn't do much at all. Right. And so when they were supposed to have the same implementation in all these different uh, neighborhoods, all these different streets, they pro almost definitely didn't, but we don't really know. We can't directly measure which of them got the better implementations and which of them didn't. And then there's also just, it's hard, it's difficult to distinguish how changes in delinquency and crime and all those things, in this case in particular, uh, were affected by this Chicago area project and how much of it was due to other factors, right? Because of the way the data was gathered and, the time period it was gathered in and all these other issues. Um, it's unclear if it was the actual processes that this program developed that created those good results or whether it was something else, right? Now, the second one we're going to talk about is um, the Moving to Opportunity program in the 90s. And this is the um, US government went in and in five different US cities, um, what they basically, they found at-risk youth. I think they were roughly 12, 13 years old. Um, and, and you know, with the uh, consent of the child and the parents and all those things, they did a pilot program where they moved those children from the inner city socially disorganized areas where they were growing up and sent them out to suburban areas to live with uh, other families or in other neighborhoods and other houses that were much more socially organized, right? And what this program showed was that the children who, you know, moved out to the suburbs rather than staying in these inner city, socially disorganized areas, they had reduced arrest and arrest rates and reduced victimization rates, um, better education, better jobs, better physical health, better mental health. So it really, really, really seemed to help the children to move out of those neighborhoods. Now, the problem with that one is there's lots of other factors that change there too, right? So, lots of other theories would also predict these benefits, not just social disorganization, right? Learning theory might predict this, that same outcome. Uh, strain theory might predict that same outcome. So it's not necessarily, you know, this increase, this benefit to these, these uh, adolescents moving away from the, the socially disorganized neighborhood aren't necessarily uh, proof that social disorganization is the best explanation for crime or even a good explanation for crime. Um, but yeah, okay. That is the end of our section on social disorganization. Um, again, I, like with all these sections, there is so much more here to say. Uh, there's a heck of a lot of stuff I'm kind of leaving out from these. Um, but 
I can't I can't have a, a, a five million hour long course. So if you're interested in this stuff, um, search around on the internet, uh, find a lot more information about all these subjects. Um, but I really appreciate you watching this one. And I'll see you in the next one.